What's up, YouTube? Let's talk a little bit about phasing. So essentially, when referring to phase, you're talking about the starting point of a waveform. When you're looking at a sine wave with zero phase, it's potentially telling you that the sine wave is starting at zero. And the further you shift the phase, the further away from zero the starting point is. So I'm going to do a little bit of an explanation uh, for you guys to show you exactly what phase is to help you understand it. And then we're going to talk about a couple of things to look out for. And that's going to be a great sort of segue into the next episode, which I'm going to talk about some sort of more advanced uh, kick and bass stuff. So anyway, without too much blabbering on, let's dive in and have a look. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of a, a basic explanation as to exactly what phase is and, you know, what it might be doing without you even sort of hearing what's happening. So I've opened up LFO tool here, but this is for demonstration purposes. So I'm not actually using it for a sidechain. I'm basically using it to so I can show you what the audio output looks like in Serum over here. So I've set up one oscillator and as you can see, uh, LFO tool is displaying the audio output of Serum, obviously. And I've set it to a single sine wave. So also by default, the random phase will be up. <clears throat> so look what happens when you put the random phase on. Every time the note re-triggers, it randomly generates a new starting point for the sine wave. So obviously, if you want a really clean low end in your track, having a random phase might not be a good thing. I mean, obviously, um, some people might argue different, you know, having a sort of dynamics might be a good thing. But I guess knowing the fundamentals of what all these different things are doing and being able to then make the choice is, um, you know, arming yourself with more sort of techniques to choose from, I guess. <clears throat> so I personally like to set the random phase to zero. That way I've got the same phase every time the bass note re-triggers. And we're going to get into why that's important a little bit later on or maybe in the next episode. Now I'm going to show you guys what happens when you introduce a, another sine wave that's tuned to the same frequency and you play with the phase. So I'm going to slowly fade this in. Both the, phase, uh, both the starting points or the phase are at zero. So they should be playing the exact same sine wave. So when you sweep the volume up, you'll notice that, like I said before, it essentially doubles the amplitude um, of the resulting signal. However, when the phase is completely inverted, i.e. 180 degrees, and the amplitudes are the same, you get perfect cancellation. So what this means is, say for example, if you've got a, one of the waveforms has a, you know, a phase that maybe changes, watch what's going to happen here. See, every time this waveform is re-triggering, we're getting a varying amplitude in that sine tone. Every time the sound re-triggers with both sine waves, one at a random phase, we're getting a wildly different amplitude in that low frequency waveform. So you're probably wondering, why does this matter? You know, if you've got the ability to control the phase when you're creating bass lines and stuff like that, why is making sure that the phase is correct so important? And it's because when you look at something like a kick drum, where that pitch is changing over time, no matter what the settings are of that pitch envelope, the phase is going to change very drastically. And I'm going to show you guys a little example here. I'm not going to get too in depth with it. I'm going to save that for the next episode. I kind of just want to use this as a sort of reference to show you guys, uh, to kind of outline to you guys what phasing is, as opposed to using the knowledge to get a cleaner sound. That I'm going to save for the next episode. But anyway, so in a previous episode, I outlined creating kick drums from scratch using Native Instruments TRK-01. So one of the benefits of creating kick drums from scratch is you've got this control over the pitch envelope and therefore resulting in control over the actual phase of the tail of the kick drum itself. So I might be getting a little bit too advanced for some guys, but just bear with me. I'm going to explain exactly what's going on. So remember, we were looking at the sine wave of the bass tone or just the regular sine wave that I created in Serum. And now when we look at the interface of TRK-01, we've got a sine wave. And you'll notice as you edit these parameters here, the phase along that sort of time of the kick drum changes quite drastically. And then you've also got two layers, which it then kind of layers over. 
Um, but I'll, I'll show you in LFO tool, it'll be a little bit more sort of easier to grasp once you look at the uh, oscilloscope there. Um, check it out. So this is what our kick drum looks like on the oscilloscope. Notice how every time the kick is triggered, it's the exact same waveform. Um, there's no changes happening here whatsoever. But when we layer something like a sine wave, like what we created in Serum just now, you'll notice that every time it triggers, it's kind of doing this weird phase up and down kind of situation, which obviously changes depending on the pitch of the bass. So here, what's happened is I've tuned this sine wave. So when we tune the sine wave to something closer to what the sort of fundamental uh, pitch of the tail of the kick drum we'll notice that it's more stable, but we've still got this kind of weird waveform happening here, which is quite wildly different to what we wanted in the kick. And you might not really be able to hear all that much different in the speakers, but trust me, it's, it's quite vastly um, altering what your low end sounds like. So this is why we use something like sidechain but when you apply too much sidechain, it can either sort of thin the kick out or thin the bass out, depending on which way you're kind of going with it. And a really cool technique to kind of apply to make sure that you get kind of the best of both worlds, but also still not having to worry about getting these uh, phase issues and stuff like that, is just taking into account the low frequency sine waves and where they're overlapping. And say, for example, um, I'm gonna just quickly apply a sidechain on to the sound. Bear in mind, I'm not hearing exactly what's going on here, so it's hard to, for me to tell. I'm mainly going on the picture, so I can kind of give you guys more of a reference. So now I've opened up this LFO tool, and I'm gonna create like a sidechain effect going on over here. So now often what happens when, when you sidechain your bass too much, like something like this, you know, it's gonna look cleaner on an oscilloscope and you're gonna get much less phase issues. However, you're cutting out a large portion of your bass line. You know, now it's gone from 4-4 four, four rolling bass into a 2-4 gallop kind of bass, if that makes sense. And you might not be wanting to do that kind of thing when we start to kind of increase and maybe give ourselves some more low end, we'll notice that, you know, we're getting a lot more phasing, you know, more of this kind of complex waveform happening. So what I like to do is kind of find the, the middle ground, you know, find the balance of where that waveform looks the most stable. Also bear in mind that you, your baseline when doing Cytrance is not going to be a sine wave. This is just to give you a reference of what's happening at your very lowest fundamental tone. But I've kind of explained, you know, the sort of additive synthesis theory and the way that most sounds that we hear are built up of a series of uh, kind of uh, fundamental and harmonic sine waves. So this should kind of be giving you a little bit more of a picture as to what's happening with the phasing of your low end. Even if you might not be hearing it with your ear or on your speakers or in your headphones or something like that, it definitely helps to have a look at it on an oscilloscope or something like that. So we've kind of like found the sweet spot over here, which is working. So you may have noticed the phase of this waveform just flipped upside down, but I just wanted to kind of outline something for you guys, why some VSTs or some plugins or some waveforms even might differ in the way that you sort of sound design them to get that kind of like ultimate sound. And I also kind of wanted to use it to show you guys uh, a neat little trick and another plugin as to why I don't use the phase inside Serum, but I rather use a external plugin, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys now what I'm talking about. So generally speaking, um, when the phase of a plugin is not on zero, there's a little bit of a click every time the note re-triggers. Um, some plugins worse than others. And I think with Serum, you've got like a 180 on some waveforms doesn't click and then, and then 360, uh, I might be wrong, but generally speaking, 
I like to leave the phase on the actual plugin itself at zero. Then what I'll do is I'll use a plugin called Timeline by a company called Forward Audio. So there is a free version of this plugin available as well called Sample Delay. I'm gonna post a link to both of them in the description, but I'm also gonna be doing like a more in-depth video showing sort of more features of both of the plugins um, and the differences and stuff like that. So definitely stay tuned for that. But essentially what this is, is it's a lot more of a accurate uh, time alignment plugin. Um, most of you guys know that uh, Cubase has got a sort of track delay um, as well as Cubase. I think most DAWs have a track delay, but what I don't like about this track delay is it's not very accurate in terms of how you kind of, you know, when you touch it, it's suddenly a thousand milliseconds, which is like, it's not very conducive to doing these kind of tiny phase shifts. And I believe that the resolution of this plugin is also much higher. Um, I think it works on a sort of 0 0.001 samples basis. And the cool thing about this is you can punch in how much variation you want. So let's say we don't even want that much. Oh, I've put it on the kick drum actually. We don't want that. So it allows you to punch in like the total amount of variation that you wanna be able to apply. So obviously, because we're talking about phase differences here, we're looking at like really, really fine differences, not, you know, 2000 samples, which is, you know, definitely audible to the human ear. So let's put in something like, you know, 20 samples and minus 20 samples. So then what it's going to do is it's going to give us the ability to kind of like shift that phase without having Serum reset the phase at a different stage if that kind of makes sense. Obviously you can get to a point where it starts to get a little bit, you know, out of tempo, but just bear in mind that the human ear can only really start to hear differences between like 25 to 35 milliseconds. And the cool thing about this plugin is it's got a readout here of meters, feet, and then milliseconds as well. So without having to even listen, you can kind of tell, is it audible? I mean, I've still got quite a lot of space to move here. I think 20 was a little bit too low. Maybe I can go like 200 and minus 200. And then, you know, we've got the ability to kind of like shift the phase of that signal, which is pretty cool. So it looks like just a little bit more than 200. I'm gonna put this up to 300. Let's maybe, we can set this both to like the positive range. So we've got like really, really fine control here. This is awesome. Um, okay, no, we don't want, let's maybe make it like 150. So you see, you've actually got a little bit more accuracy even than just adjusting the phase within the plugin itself. So definitely, definitely recommend this plugin. I'm gonna post a link to this one and the free version in the description. I'm also gonna do like a full walkthrough of both of them, so definitely stay tuned for that. Also, for those who are like, this doesn't make any sense because we're using saw waves and that kind of thing. Also remember, I have done a tutorial on, you know, breaking apart the oscillator and using a sine wave as your fundamental and then removing the fundamental from the other oscillator. So from that, I'm sure you guys can deduce being able to split these apart, clean up the sine oscillator and then add that extra sort of saw harmonics on top. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be covering that in the next episode. So definitely stay tuned for that. Awesome, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know what you think in the comments. A big thanks to IDM Mag, proud supporters of the dance music scene and my channel. As always, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. See you guys next time.